I know some people prefer to watch short videos. So uh, before we actually start uh, with this long video, uh, what we are going to do, I'm going to play very short clip where is uh, one of the very interesting moments from this long video. Uh, so if you don't have like a lot of time to watch the full video, then uh, at least I hope this very short clip is going to be helpful for you. And in this short clip, John is going to talk a little bit about this PCB antenna, what we can see here. So here is the clip. Why did they flare this thing out? It wasn't just to make it look pretty. They're adding capacitance that's coupling over to here. So you see, here's an inductance to ground, and this is a capacitance hooked over to this inductance. So they get very fancy on all this stuff. The ground, the distance this guy is from the ground matters, okay? Because you're, 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 exciting, you're exciting currents in the ground plane, your exciting currents right in here. See, this is attaching right here. The, the vias here matter, where they're positioned. It all matters. And that's called loading the antenna. All this stuff is loading the antenna. This was very interesting. And that's why I selected this clip, because I never really thought about PCB antenna having uh, capacitors and inductors in the design of the PCB antenna. So for me, it was kind of eye-opening how I should look at PCB antenna designs in future. And uh, if you would like to continue watching this video, then this is what we are going to talk about next. We are going to start with a very simple antenna, this monopole antenna. And before we actually move to a PCB antenna, we are going to learn all the basics which we really need to know about antennas. So uh, we are going to talk about these graphs. We are going to try to understand what we can see here and also here. And also we will talk about the parameters of an antenna so we know if an antenna is good or bad. Then we will uh, simulate this very simple antenna here you can see the very simple antenna. We will have a look at the uh, fields around this antenna. And once we know all these uh, essentials around the antennas, we will have a look at this first example of a PCB antenna. We will simulate it and we will have a look on the fields of this antenna. We will talk about these fields so everyone understand what we can see here and what uh, or how useful these uh, graphs can uh, be and how they can help us. And then also we will have a look at different design of PCB antenna. This is second example. And we will have a look at the fields of this second PCB antenna. Also, we will talk a lot about uh, some graphs which you may find useful if you will be designing your own antennas. This video is based on my call with John. Uh, we had like three hours long call, which I recorded, uh, cut down to one and a half hour. And um, that's what you will see. I really hope you will find it interesting and I really hope you will learn something new. Uh, we are going to start with a very basic antenna, which is called monopole antenna, but I will leave John to talk. Uh, so here is the recorded call, which I had with John. A monopole is basically just a wire sticking up from a ground plane and attached at the other end to a connector. So think of an uh, uh, RG, you know, a cable. We've stripped off the outer cladding. 
We have the inner wire. We stick it through the ground plane. The ground of the cable attaches to the ground plane. So, you know, typically you'd be using a connector here, a screw okay. in the connector. And uh, so that's your ground. And then the wire is the center conductor going up. For Bluetooth, Bluetooth works at 2.45 gigahertz. So the way it works for Maxwell's equations, we take the speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And if we divide our frequency, if we divide the speed of light by frequency, uh, high school physics, that's your wavelength of a wave. And it's 12.24 centimeters long. Now, a monopole, and I'll, I'll explain this more in a minute, it's a quarter of a wavelength long. And I do my arithmetic, and I get 3.06 centimeters is the length of a monopole that we want. And what you're seeing on the right there, Robert, are radiation patterns. And I'll be showing more examples of this. And what you're seeing is the radiated power coming out of that antenna in various planes, OK? Um, and this, well, we can kind of read this guy. Um, normally, they orient the antenna vertically. So mm -hmm. Z is up, and then X and Y are, you know, on the plane of the ground plane. And you can see what they've got there are various cuts in the upper right picture, three principal planes. And notice the XY plane, it's saying that the, the radiation is coming out equally in all directions from the antenna. So it's... Uh... X and Y plane, that's the view from the top, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it uh, radiates uh, equally from to the all... All, uh, all directions, which you'd expect yeah. because it's just a wire antenna. Yes. If we spin it around, it looks the same. I mean, by symmetry, it should have the same pattern. There's no reason it would not be the same. Looking ahead a little bit, if you have other objects near the antenna, like a hand, the wrist of your, you know, from your arm, metal, metal housing, it won't be the same going all the way around. Well, I, have one nearby question. I have one more question. Why yeah. in the X and Y plane, the numbers are from the top, like zero, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, minus 40. I would expect the power be highest in the center and and then go uh, okay. lower and lower. Okay, I, I see what you're thinking about here. Okay. So when you look at these circles and it's it, it, what they're showing you is the field intensity at infinity. So don't think how far from the antenna you are. You're far enough from the antenna. There's no concept here of how far from the antenna. It, you're infinitely far away. And you say, well, infinitely far away, there should be like very little power received, right? Because it's going, going out in this sphere. So what you're really looking at there is it's the power intensity per unit solid angle. If we radiate a milliwatt of power, zero dBm, it radiates out. And it doesn't radiate out well. And you can see the bottom right picture. That's kind of a 3D plot of it, mm -hmm. right? Out of that, if we integrate, if we add up the power in that entire surface, it's zero dBm. It's radiating outward. Now, <clears throat> as you go out to infinity, the power in any little piece of area gets lower, right? But when you add up the power over the whole surface, which is also getting infinitely big, you still get zero dBm. So the circles, the way to read them, it's not, there's, it's not how far from the antenna you are. It's saying at infinity, very far away, you will have that power intensity per unit solid angle. So in the test range, when they measure the power from the antenna, what is the receiving antenna? And typically, they're using a little horn antenna. And you, you see these, you know. And, and so imagine, Robert, you're using your little horn antenna. And you get, you know, one meter away from the antenna. And you measure the power coming into the horn. Now we move the horn antenna 10 meters away. You'll see less power. Agree? Which is, I think, you're going, yeah, yeah. that's what's going on. Yeah. But the reason is, remember, this plot 
is the amount of power per unit solid angle, okay? So when you're close to the antenna, think of the area of your horn. It's a lot of solid angle. Way out here, it's very small solid angle. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get less power. Now, there's one thing I do want to say. I do want to say, too, that I don't want to get into it too much. But when you look at the fields from an antenna, what, what they're showing you here are the far fields. And we're mm -hmm. assuming that we're far enough away from the antenna that it look local. Okay, again, we have the sphere of energy going out. And you're a little ant up here, a little bug, right? Mm -hmm. A teeny bug. Locally, when you see that wave coming at you, it looks at like what we call a plane wave. You know, it just looks like a wave of energy. And the electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other. And they're mm -hmm. coming at you, Okay. Locally, a plane wave. That's called the far field of the antenna, all right? Whenever they take these measurements and stuff, they're assuming you're in the far field. <coughs> now, what if you get close? There's something called the near field. And it's not as simple as just this sphere. Mm -hmm. And that's where it depends on the geometry and it gets very complicated. But that's not what we are interested about. That's not the radiated power. You okay. are interested in that for your signal integrity people. Things like uh, electromagnetic interference and once part of the circuit talks to another, right? Or maybe you have an antenna nearby, you know, fairly close and what's going on. That's all near field stuff. And so you can't just think of it as a sphere. But ultimately for radiation, yes. What we're talking about is like the sphere going out. And what you're seeing here are the patterns of that power going out to infinity. Basically on the picture, on the bottom picture, you can actually very nicely see that uh, the power f even further from the uh, center of the antenna is like five decibels and closer to the center, it goes lower. That's exactly what you just explained. Yeah, yeah. And let me show you another picture of this now in, a, in an EM simulator. The picture on the right here was done in an EM simulator. And we'll take a look at this. Same problem exactly. You'll see the fields again, but it, it, a little different look at it. I can rotate it. So okay. Uh, let's uh, talk also about this X and Z plane, because again, there is uh, this uh, center, but X and Z plane, I would expect uh, which view. So, so X and Y is from the top and X yep. and Z is going to be from, from the side, from, from the side, side or from, from front. Yeah. yeah. One will be from and, front. And let and me go, one's... let me go into the software and I'll show you that because okay. it's the exact same thing in the software. Okay. Before we leave the slide though, Robert, I did want to, I'm going to discuss before we're done today, these concepts. Okay. Uh, which you see, it says uh, in the middle of the slide, right? And, and this is came from their spec sheet for this antenna. And it's important that your viewers have an idea what these things mean. Okay. So we've already discussed pattern a little bit and we will more, you know, what, where it's radiating. We also have the concept of the input impedance to an antenna. This one's 50 ohms. That's very standard in selling 50 ohm. Something called the return loss, 22 dB. That's how much is reflected back from your cable. We're putting and power in our bigger cable. Bigger is better or lower is better? Bigger, big, bigger is better. We would love infinite return loss, which I've always thought it sounds um, contradictory, right? It sounds to me like if I have huge return loss, it sounds bad. But, but it huge means everything was radiated. Yeah, yeah. It means we lost all our return. It means nothing came back. Yeah. So we, so bigger is better. Now, practically, uh, let me give you practical numbers here. Okay. Well, as long as we're on this right now, um, ideally, I want to see 50 ohm input on an antenna. Why 50 ohms? It's because the industry is standardized on it. 50 ohms. Uh, you will see for, um, you know, the old two-wire TV antennas, 75 ohms, 300 ohms. There are certain standard numbers. Your um, viewers, if they start playing with this, they're going to buy a trans 
receiver module from a vendor. And they're going to hook it up through traces. We get to the inverted F. They're going to hook it up to the antenna. The trans receiver module, typically they want to see 50 ohms, right? It's an industry standard. What if you don't have 50 ohms? Uh, typically, you could see this thing, say, 30 through 80, 75, 80 ohms. You've got to make a matching network. You've got to match 80 ohms to 50 ohms. And, you know, you do a little LC section. Mm -hmm. It's a little, fit, little matching network. And your viewers can make one of those. You know, it'd be a little L and a little C to ground. And you need a matching network or you're going to get really bad return loss. But then where, where do you place these uh, uh, L and C? Um, <clears throat> you place it as close as you can to the input of the antenna. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. when we get to the inverted F antenna, which is a planar type antenna, which is what most of your viewers will probably be working with, uh, it'll be more obvious to you. Where you okay. Uh, it's not so obvious with the monopole. Uh, okay, so, so return loss. I want to see my return loss 10 dB or better. Okay. And, 20, and above 20 dB is wonderful. That's great. Tw a 10 dB means 10% of your input power is reflected, which... Depends on the antenna I can live with. 20 dB means 1% of your input power is reflecting. That's a very good number. Practically, it's very difficult to get below that with a real antenna of this type, okay? The efficiency, and this is where it gets confusing, and, and we'll, <clears throat> we'll, we'll talk about this a couple different times. Efficiency, people say, oh, I know what that means. That, that intuitively means uh, there's power that going in and only so much radiates, right? And that is what it means, actually. If you put a milliwatt of, end of power into our monopole here, right? What the efficiency of 80% says is 80% of the power I put in radiates. What happened to the other 20%, right? It heats the antenna. So it's loss in the dielectric. It's conductor loss uh, is, is the main two. 80% on this type of antenna is quite frankly not all that impressive, okay? If we just had a bare wire, it would probably be 99% because the only heating is coming from heating the copper wire, which isn't much. Now here's the point of confusion, Robert. Efficiency, a lot of people think efficiency includes the power loss due to reflection. It doesn't, okay? This is power that got into the antenna. So let's make up some numbers. From your transceiver, you know, from the power amplifier feeding this whole thing, out comes one milliwatt. It goes down your, you know, your line on your board, and uh, <clears throat> we have our connector to our monopole. The one milliwatt, let's say 10% of it reflects because you don't have the right impedance matching, right? You've already lost 10% of your power, right? Then you go into the antenna and this antenna is 80% efficient. Well, I'm losing 20% of the remaining 90%. So the efficiency doesn't account for the reflection. You're gonna lose power through that too. So don't get confused on efficiency. This is just a property of the antenna. It's like I got the power into it. Can I get it to radiate? Because it's going to heat the antenna, heat the dielectric. Later on, we'll be working with FR4 with an inverted F. FR4 is not friendly to RF designers. Okay. Above a few gigahertz, it gets horribly lossy. Try using an RF board at, say, millimeter wave, like 26 gigahertz. It's a toaster. <clears throat> About all you're going to do with an FR4 board at 26 gigahertz, your standard cheapo board, is you can heat your hands with it because you're not getting anything else going on. Really? You, you can to... actually feel it's heating No, up. probably not. I'm feeling... <laughs> well, I suppose putting up power and you can melt it. But the point is it's terrible. And so what they have to do... I'm digressing a bit here. 
what you have to do uh, for your board people is typically on these real RF system boards, like a base station, right? For, for five, you know, cell tower and they have these boards. They'll actually, these boards will be like 16 layers, very complicated boards. And what you, all those digital signals, control signals and all that, they run it through the middle layers with FR4 because, you know, it's maybe a giga, you know, even PDR5 and all these fancy things, it's a couple gigahertz tops, so they can do it. Well, that 26 gigahertz RF part, they need a special layer of, of uh, Teflon. It's, that's very, it's much more expensive than FR4, but it's very low loss. And so these multi-clad boards, they'll typically put the RF at the top couple layers with much oh. more expensive material. Because otherwise you've got a big old toaster. And efficiency is king on this stuff for RF. Gain is how, uh, let's say you want your uh, radiation to be going in a certain direction, right? GPS satellite, the satellite is above you. If you're talking to the satellite, I'd love to have most of the power going up to the satellite, not this way to the sides. Okay. So peak, uh, peak gain is when you look at the antenna pattern, it's the amount of power in the direction where there's the most radiation over the sphere. So here, a peak gain of four means we have uh, four... Uh, it can be in dB or not. I didn't put dB down. Let's assume it's not dB. Uh, what it means is in the direction where it's radiating the most, it's radiating with a power density four times bigger than my isotropic sphere. So isotropic sphere, one milliwatt all directions. If I have a pattern with a gain of four in that direction, I'm doing four times better. Okay, which so there will be some kind of peak, lobes. which is going to be yeah, better, right? yeah, and we'll see that in a minute. And, Let me uh, go. and yeah. a higher is better. Well, it depends on your application, and that's a great question. So, I'm going to do this, Robert. I'm going to move on to software. Okay, okay. And we'll keep talking about the same stuff. So now this higher is our antenna. Uh, that's our antenna in a box. I'll zoom in on it. In the me. box. I see something. Uh, this is, what we are seeing here is an electromagnetic simulator. Now, remember I said Maxwell's equations are so hard to solve, and they are. That's why that crazy professor in college had a sphere with one charge. That's about all they can solve, okay, analytically with pencil and paper. Um, Fortunately, now we have electric, we have numerical tools, and, and there are a number of these on the market. Uh, Cadence, of course, we have ours. Because uh, so our this, is, this is AWR, yeah. or what is it? Yeah, this is uh, the piece of software you're looking at here is called Microwave Office. And microwave it's from Cadence, Office. yeah, correct? Yeah, it's, it's made by, it says AWR because AWR, we got acquired by Cadence a year ago. So we're part of Cadence right now. Uh, but but AWR is, is, is software for microwave and RF designers. And in that environment, you can do circuit design. So your boards, if you will. Uh, we can do filters, RF filters. Uh, mimic, uh, what's a mimic? Uh, microwave integrated circuit, right? People at Samsung doing a gallium nitride circuit for that cell phone, right? The power amplifier. They'd use our software. Okay. And board designers, I'm making a... 2.45 gigahertz filter, RF style filter, distributed lines and stuff. Most of your, most of your viewers uh, here are used to lump filters, L's and C's. You also can make filters out of transmission lines and you could do that in the software. As part of that, we have a couple electromagnetic simulators and the one I'm showing you is called Analyst and it's finite elements. And the way it works is we draw the thing up and it looks like, and that's our monopole. You can see it. Which one? Because there are like two lines or what is it? If I zoom in, ah, it's okay. just a wire. And down, what is down? It's just uh, zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And what you're seeing, if I zoom way in here, look at uh, that. Okay. So mm -hmm. that is what's sticking up through the bottom plane, which is our ground plane. Mm -hmm. And you see this now would be your coax cable that attaches from mm -hmm. here. And the center conductor is our wire. And of course, we the blue is the dielectric of the coax. I, I made that uh, PTFE, poly, whatever it is, vinyl ethylide. 2.2 dielectric constant, very standard cable material. Uh, I made this for RG58 cable, 50 ohm cable. And I mean, you can make one of these at home. You just literally strip off the insulator. Uh, you literally now cut a hole in your metal ground plane and you of course would have a connector to your RG58 cable, 50 ohm cable, and that's it. And it's uh, one quarter wavelength on, right? So my question, so, uh... The ground plane, yeah. uh, or basically the uh, middle of the antenna, it goes through the ground plane and it is connected Correct. under the ground plane. Correct. And we have okay. what we call in this business a port, a wave port underneath the ground plane. That okay. You just saw, and that excites the antenna. Okay. And the that antenna, would be like, you, said, you said specific length for this antenna, it would be well, the. One, one quarter wavelength, 307 millimeters. Okay. Perfect. All right. That's what we decided that was. Okay. So I simulate this. Now what it does is it, um, it solves for the electric and magnetic fields in the box. And, oh, and you say, hey, wait a minute. There's not a box in real life here, right? I mean, you know, it just goes out to infinity. What's the box about? And you're right on that. The trouble is if we mesh, I might have the meshes here. Can we see these? Uh, let's see, Robert, if I can show you a mesh. There you go. Now, what you're seeing here, and it's always hard to see meshes in 3D on a 2D screen, but what I've done is I've meshed the whole volume with, with pyramids. They're 3D triangles called tetrahedra. And on each one of those, we're solving for the electric field. I understand. So basically the, uh, the, oops, the cube is the space where we are going to calculate the yeah. fields. We don't the want fields. to make it infinite because then calculation would take ages. A long time. It's yeah. a, it takes a long time to So the cube it. are the edges where we are going yeah. to calculate. And so you say, well, wait a minute though. Doesn't the edges interfere with the answer, right? And the answer is it can't. And so one of the tricks they play is this boundary of this cube on all these sides, except for the bottom, which is metal, right? It's copper. Um, all these sides have a special boundary condition called an absorbing boundary condition. And when they do the math, I liken it to, you know, in the anechoic chamber and they have, again, I mentioned the pyramids. We've seen them, those ice cream cones, which are very expensive. Those things are absorb energy. And what they're doing is they're trying to trick the antenna range when it radiates and hits those, it absorbs, it, they're made of carbon. It's so possible. antenna means it still travels. Away. So it looks like the range doesn't have the walls. Yeah, okay. And, and they're doing the same thing here. Uh, mathematically, these surfaces are like they're not there. Now it's an approximation and this is where you get into how good is that approximation? How big is the box? So when you, when you learn to drive these tools, there's a lot of issues like that, but I don't want to get into it. Let's see what the pattern looks like. And okay. let's talk about that. How big is the plate on the bottom? You, uh, from the picture before, it's supposed uh, to let, yeah, let, be yeah, let's, 30 by 30 centimeters, I guess. Right, let's go ahead and measure that. You know, I didn't really check. Uh, 100, uh, 100, this is only 10 centimeters, Robert. Okay. Uh, so it should really be bigger according to the vendor. So that's a good point. Okay, let's take a look at the pattern. And I'm gonna open this up quickly. Okay, let's look at, I don't wanna get, we'll talk about all these in a minute. I think this, yeah, this is the one I want right here. There you go. Now, looks like a mushroom or something, right? 
So what you're seeing here is this is a 3D picture of the antenna pad, of this antenna. You know, and, what, what is the first thing what I notice? Mm. It's not coming out from the antenna. It's above the antenna. It's above the antenna. And that is, um, do not worry about that. That's because they're superimposing the 3D antenna pattern on this picture. And in reality, is it really In going? reality, yes, it's coming out from the antenna. Okay. Yeah. And remember this, again, this, this pattern you're seeing, this is infinitely far away, right? This isn't, so again, there's no concept of distance from the antenna when you're okay. looking at this. But you see what you've got here. Now, remember from our slide for their monopole, they said in the XY plane, it looked the same in all mm -hmm. directions. That was what you were seeing. See, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all the same. Now, if we look in the XZ plane, um, it's going to look like actually this. And you see, if you go up here, if we're straight above the antenna, you don't get any power. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the side of the antenna, you get the most power. Mm -hmm. So then what we're looking at here, if you look at the game and you see our little, you know, curved, our little, um, what am I looking at? Uh, legend down here, okay. And you see 4.94 for the maximum. What this is saying is if for this particular antenna, if you are over here in the XY plane at the same vertical position as the antenna, you get the maximum power and the power density is 4.94. And this is in DB now. Mm -hmm. So whatever that, it's 4.94 DB higher than if this thing were just radiating like a sphere. If you're over here, so that's good, right? That's your gain, your directive gain, okay, is, is that much better. But if you're straight above this antenna, you're getting no power. Mm -hmm. Now, is that good or bad, right? Well, it depends. So remember, let's say that we're trying to receive power from this antenna, like Bluetooth, right? Or Wi-Fi or a satellite. So the first question is, can you tell me where the transmitter is? And normally you can't. Normally with Bluetooth, you can't say, oh, the transmitter is in this room and it's over here sitting in this direction, right? So the trouble with doing that, if your transmitter, if this is your transmitter and you're sitting here and the orientation is you're straight above this transmitter, guess what? You don't get anything. And as you walk around the room, it fades in and fades out. It, that, that can happen. Another problem we've got here that I haven't talked about yet is called the polarization of the pattern. Now, let's talk about that right now. <clears throat> What's polarization? When we look at this radiated power, it, it's a wave coming at us. And it has an electric field and a magnetic field. And they're both perpendicular. Um, if we're staring here, and here comes the power right at us, Robert. Let me zoom in a little, right? The electric and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, like my arrow is moving. And they're both parallel, they're both in a plane that's coming at us. Did that make sense? There's no electric or magnetic field in our direction. It's all perpendicular to us. And there's an E field and an H, and they're perpendicular to each other. Uh, if you're well with your hand, it's kind of this classic. You'll see an EM, they'll do this kind of stuff, right? E cross H, direction of travel. Now, okay, fine. Well, the polarization of the antenna is, for example, linear polarization is the direction of the, is the, direction of the E field coming at you, right? Okay, fine. So it could be this way vertically, it could be horizontally. Well, who cares? Well, depending on the type of antenna you've got, you do much better with certain polarizations. This antenna, a vertical monopole, has the E field in the direction of the transmitting antenna. It's this way. So guess what happens if you have a receiving monopole 
and you put it horizontally, you get almost nothing. And when you take your receiving antenna and rotate it vertically, you get the most power. In other words, the orientation of your antenna for a linear polarized wave varies from zero to maximum. I remember when I was a kid, we had to go outside and we had to run with the antennas to catch some movies. That, exactly. <laughs> and let's talk about let's talk about that for a minute. Now. So you say, well, if I know the orientation of my transmitter, the polarization of the wave, the direction of the E field, I can be really efficient because my receiver can be in the same direction, right? And we're not wasting power in the transmitter from other polarizations. That's true. So let's take the old AM radio, right? 1440 kilohertz. And we've all seen them out on the countryside. Those are those huge towers, right? That's AM radio and they're vertical. Guess what? They're monopole antennas. Now, the thing about AM radio, 1440 kilohertz, it's so low in frequency that that isn't even a quarter wavelength. They look huge, right? They're incredibly tall. They're still not a quarter wavelength. And so they actually load them with stuff to get some power into them. They're not very efficient. Remember efficiency, you know, reflection. You just can't get a lot of power into those. Now they put in kilowatts. I mean, they crank it up, but they're wasting a lot of power. Well, anyway, what, what direction are they? Vertical. Your AM antenna, you want to be vertical. And what do they have on cars in the good old days? You had the aerial vertical antenna. Ah. If you take that car antenna and make it horizontal, terrible. Let's talk FM. Okay. Do you know what direction, Robert, FM radio is polarized? Think of FM. Think of an FM it's not, radio. It's not saying. Think I don't TV. know. Think, think of TV. You said you had to run up on the roof. Remember rabbit ears? Yeah, we rabbit. had dipole usually. Yeah, like a dipole. Yeah, it's horizontal. FM is, is polarized horizontal, not vertically. So you want your FM antenna, right? You had the thing and you had it go this way, horizontal. You don't want it vertical. So how they the, build the towers for FM? Well, FM, you know, 100 megahertz, when you do the wavelength calculation, the wavelength is three meters long. Ah, so they can do it like this. Yeah, so that's why, and so it, it's, much, it's much shorter wavelength antenna. If you're using a resonant type antenna, uh, which this is, right? It's the string vibrating. Uh, you make a much shorter antenna, they make them horizontal. Uh, so when that, you look at- Is there like a reason why they do it horizontally and then also vertically? Is it like because they don't collide to each other or because they spread better or- uh, 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 Often there is a reason and you know what? I'd have to look it up, I don't remember. Okay. Because remember, uh, I'll take a guess on the AM. The AM antenna is such a low frequency that the that earth, ground, dirt, is it's not a perfect conductor, but it, it's a pretty good conductor. As you go lower in frequency, ground, earth, becomes a better conductor. This is why house wiring, you know, you always ground, you know, you literally take a piece of metal and throw it in the ground or your plumbing pipes and you get it in the ground. It actually can be a, a reasonable ground when lightning strikes, it goes down there. It's such low frequency, it's a pretty good conductor. Well, uh, so AM, I'm guessing since ground is pretty conductive, you're better off with vertical. Mm -hmm. Also to make the antenna, they're so huge. You know, obviously you would love it to be mm -hmm. a tower vertical. Uh, FM, I, you know, I, I'm sure may some of our viewers know I could look it up. There is a reason they didn't randomly pick it. Okay. Last one for you. Now let's take a GPS satellite. So it's spinning around out there, right? So first of all, for our receiving antenna, we'd like it to be looking up. We'd like the pad. So this would be a disaster what mm -hmm. we're seeing here vertically at zero. So we want to be looking up, whatever antenna we're using. What polarization is the transmitter? And we don't know, right? Because, you know, it depends on where we're. So when they transmit from a satellite, they use both, mm -hmm. both polarizations. And they say, hey, whoever you are with your cell phone, 
at least you'll get half of it. <laughs> but you'll get something. So, so they, have, they, they have two kinds of antennas? Well, they have one antenna and it transmits both polarizations. So it's, ah, okay. It's, and it's called circular polarization. Okay. So, so one way to do that, you could have a, for us, we could have a di this, we could have an a antenna this way and this way, feeding them both, you know. And so it, you get circular polar, they call it circular polarization. Depending on how the E field is phased, it can actually, you can transmit both, or they actually will have one E field, but in time he kind of goes around like this. That's called circular. But the point is they're transmitting both, you know, all polarizations because they don't know you with your cell phone, with your GPS, they don't know how you're oriented. The only thing you know on that satellite is it's up. We want to be up. Uh, this is my theoretical antenna now from the software. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the only reason, and this again, you see that nice big dip, we're mm -hmm. looking E theta, that's that XZ we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Theta zero is up vertically. And now you see the theoretical pattern much closer. You do get a little backscatter because I had a finite ground plane, right? And now this is the antenna itself. This guy, okay. When we talk antennas, we're in the world of RF. And when you're, when you're um, viewers, lighter viewers, we're in the world of circuits, right? And so what do they talk about? They talk about uh, current, they talk about voltage, impedance, et cetera. In the world of RF, we think of a transmission line. Think of one of your traces. It's really a line from, and it's coming from the transceiver. A wave comes down the line, your transmission line, hits the antenna and some of it reflects. That whole world of waves in the world of RF, we talk about S parameters. And I don't wanna get into this too much, but an S parameter, S11 tells me when I have a wave go into port one, think of our antenna, this tells me how much comes back. It's the ratio of the reflected power to the incident. And it includes phase, this is the magnitude. So what we would like for our antenna, looking into our antenna here, I would like S11 to be negative infinity. I want no power coming back. Okay. But only for the specific Indeed. frequency, no? Right. It's a resonant antenna, right? We can't build one a dish. It's just too big. So a resonant antenna has, is at a certain frequency. As you move away from that, it stops becoming resonant, and it's called the bandwidth of the antenna. Now, remember, Bluetooth is 24 to 25 uh, gigahertz. We'd like a bandwidth of 100 megahertz. I'd like to be able to pick up something anywhere in that band because the specific transmitter is going to be a little different. And then of course they have different channels and all this kind of stuff. Different channel for us means they're moving it a little bit more, you know? So anyway, we want, we would like a hundred megahertz bandwidth is typically defined. Uh, like, well, there's different ways to define it. If I want to be certainly 10 dB or better, so you will be looking for the minus 10 dB in your graph. And you. yeah, and you will see the bandwidth is basically yeah, from that point. To, okay, I understand. My, my antenna works from here to here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Okay. Now notice with the impedance I have, I am getting down. Okay. At minus 10 dB, what that's saying is 10% of my power is being reflected. Mm -hmm. It's not even getting into the antenna. I remind you again, the power that gets into the antenna, not all of it radiates. That's called the efficiency. Okay. Now this antenna, the efficiency is nine, uh, this antenna, the monopole, the efficiency is 99%. Because mm -hmm. it's just a, it's not heating anything, right? It's a wire. But this guy, let's get to the inverted F. This is what you're, viewers are more likely to try to make. And this is printed on a PCB board, a piece of FR4. I actually got this design from Texas Instruments and mm -hmm. I have right here on this slide, I didn't give the whole length, but if they just search for 2.4 gigahertz inverted F 
Texas Instruments, they'll find it. And they have the, uh, I think they even have the DXF. I, I think they have the layout. You can literally bring it into your layout tool if you want to. Uh, this is a design they did for, for Bluetooth. It's uh, for FR4 4.47. And we can see here, and I can go to, I think I will. Let's go to the software because I actually simulated it. See if we can get this. Uh, I think this is it right here. So what you're seeing here, Robert, is the following. You're seeing two layers of metal. Mm -hmm. And that is a FR4 board. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've metalized both sides. The bottom is ground plank. Mm -hmm. It's your ground. And those bricks, now to simplify and make the simulation faster, I made the ground via squares. Mm -hmm. These are, they're circles in real life, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But I made them squares because it's fewer meshes. And mm -hmm. it's really so basically you have then ground also on the top? Well, okay. So when From we electrical the, point of view. Yeah, yeah. So when we build the board, the bottom's a ground plane. The top is mostly a ground plane here, right? And then what they do to, is the antenna is sticking out here. So this is more FR4. So if you see, can you see my cursor? Yes, I can see. Okay, so the, the FR4 comes out this far. Maybe we can see that better in the 2D. I understand it just... Yeah, it, yeah. the FR4 is actually coming yeah. out here. Yeah, okay. As a matter of fact, I cheated when I did this simulation, the FR4 comes all the way to the boundary of the box. But anyway, the FR4 is continuing but they've cut away the ground plane on both sides. So the, mm -hmm. this is the antenna. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to put an antenna like this and you have ground plane right below it, like you would with a, a line, right? Normally you have your lines on your board and you have a ground plane, you know, another plane below it. And in your signal integrity talk, you spend all this time talking about split ground planes and the return current on the ground plane. If you take a piece of metal and put a ground plane right below it, it won't radiate. Now you say, well, why is that, right? Well, the reason is we have currents on the antenna, but we also have currents on the ground plane. And I know I saw some of your previous uh, interviews uh, with people like Eric uh, Bogatin, and there's a lot of talk about the recurrent current coming right, right underneath the piece of metal and how far it spreads. Well, if you, so one way to say it is, well, that would want to radiate too, but since it's the exact opposite direction, the radiation of it is going to have the opposite polarization, so it sums up to zero. It's one way to think about it. It's like you have an antenna and an opposite antenna right next to it, and, you know, it's all linear, so, so this guy and minus, it doesn't radiate. So the closer you get it, an antenna to a ground plane, the less it radiates. The way they excite it in our simulation is you see this one and minus one, mm -hmm. and the minus one is on the ground plane below. Mm -hmm. That one minus one, they're saying to it somehow, well, this is the input to your antenna. Like before we had the connector with the RG58, that's called your reference plane, right? You know, right? There, that's it. They're saying somehow you are connecting here and here. Now, how do you make that connection? Well, they're not telling you how to do that in this example. It could be, uh, you could have two wires, you know, like a little twin X cable and you solder here and you solder to your ground plane. It more likely is somehow you're gonna be running I, honestly, I'm not quite sure how they want you to do it. We probably would have to read the document, right? So that so would be, be a chip, probably, no? And it would, the it, output it could of be the a chip, chip would be connected there. 
uh, that could be it, Robert. It could well be there's a chip sitting, you know, it, the chip wants this as a ground, maybe the chip is probably right here. You're probably right. And then there's a ground below and it connects. So you have to read the document how you would really connect it. But what they're saying for this simulation, this is what we've got. I'm assuming you're getting power into here and here's your ground reference. Well, this is very interesting because what you are doing, you are basically connecting your output electrically directly to ground, correct? Correct. Well, uh, well, actually, be careful here now. Of course, we're driving power into the antenna. Yes. So the current is coming into one. Yes. And it's just, you know, if we just think of the input of the antenna, that is like circuit theory. We're putting power into it, and power has to come out of it, of course. And the power coming out of it is coming here in minus one. But it's like, from electrical point of view, it, is it like making short circuit between... It, from a, uh, well, no, no. From an electrical point of view, I can tell you what the impedance, think of this, forget all this metal. From an electrical point of view, from circuit theory, as far as you're concerned, to drive the antenna, this is like an imp input impedance. It's a Z. And one end of the Z is connected to ground, and one uh -huh. end you're going to connect to. If you, if you use DVM, you would measure up zero ohm, but because we are working with 2.45 megahertz, it's not going uh, to be zero ohm, yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah. be something different. Yeah. And then you as a circuit designer, well, let's take a look at the answer actually, Robert, I got it right here. Uh, this is interesting. Oh, that's why it works like this. Yeah, okay, so here is, here's the result, okay. This is the input of the antenna, all right? Now, what we've got going here, as a matter of fact, this is called a Smith chart. This is a wonderful device, okay? And if it, RF engineers love these things. They're called Smith charts. There actually was a man named Mr. Smith, had the patent on it, uh, 1920s Bell Labs. And they still use them today. And if, you if your readers really wanna start getting into RF, they need to understand a Smith chart. And very quickly, what a Smith chart is, is when we're looking into our antenna, there's an impedance there. I can say this looks like 30 plus J15 ohms, right? It's a course complex impedance. I can also tell you how much of the wave is reflected, how much power, et cetera. It's all here on the Smith chart. So very quickly, uh, this is what the input looks like, the purple curve. What we would like on the Smith chart is for it to be when we want the antenna to work, we want it at the center of the Smith chart, mm -hmm. which is in these fancy grids here says, the, and it's normalized to 50 ohms. Smith charts are always normalized something. This would be one zero right at the center, 50 ohm real, zero ohm reactive. It's not inductive or capacitive. Inductive as you go up, capacitive as you go down. Mm -hmm. So it would say this antenna, as far as you're concerned, Robert, circuit designer, is a 50 ohm resistor. Please drive a 50 ohm resistor. Okay, that's what it is. Now, as you go along here, you're also picking up inductance or capacitance. So remember that matching circuit? The Smith chart can tell you what you need to match it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need this much capacitance, this much resistance. If you had a terrible antenna, <laughs> okay, like our lambda over four monopole, except we're way low in frequency, on the Smith chart, you're going to be over here at the right. It's an open circuit. Mm -hmm. It's saying your input impedance, as far as you're concerned, is 10,000 ohms. You'll never drive it. So you as the circuit designer are viewing the antenna as an impedance, a load. You're driving a load. And that's the world of circuit theory. I can't explain why the antenna has to be lambda over four in circuit theory, but I can explain to a circuit designer, it's a 50 ohm load. As far as you're concerned to drive it, you've got to drive 50 ohms, or you've got to match it to get the maximum power into the antenna. So that's where the antenna meets circuit theory. So back here in the picture again, 
right? As far as you're concerned, this one, this uh, 3D picture is better. Right? Yeah, this guy right here. This is a 50 ohm resistor from here to ground. Please for 2.45 megahertz. Gig, uh, gigahertz. Gigahertz. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You want to go down? To, you're back in AM <laughs> radio there. <laughs> yeah. 2.45 gigahertz, Robert. Please make all your circuitry so you can drive that and receive it. That gives us the maximum power into the antenna. And then the magic of the antenna designer makes it radiate and all that stuff. Very quickly, because we're kind of running out of time here. Yeah, okay. And, you know, I'd be happy to continue this in another webinar. I, I, seems like you're finding it interesting. Uh, it's fun stuff. Why all the, you know, we, remember we had our monopole, right? Why not just take the antenna and come here and come straight out lambda or four? Well, that takes up a lot of space. Okay, so why not just bend it? So like this, right? And you can do that. The trouble is, remember I said the matching again, right? It's not 50 ohms, there's reactants and all that. Well, what they'll do is all of this stuff in here, these two guys here and all this, and why did this get wider here? Those, you can think of those as L's and C's. This is extra inductance. This is a little capacitance coupling over to here. It's like a distributed LC network. It also couples over to the ground plane. And all that stuff is to match the antenna to your circuitry. And to use, okay. just simply use capacitor and inductor? You can, you can. You can do a lumped L and a lumped C on the board and they do that. But a lot of this they'll do in the antenna and the advantage is it works over a broader band and it's especially, and it, it's, and it quite frankly is, from your viewpoint as a circuit designer, it's simpler. It's already done for you and they've matched it. So the th reason they have the inverted F, why do they call it F? See, here's, if, you, if we, I guess we go, to, I guess that's a backwards F, right? You see, yeah. And they have variants of this, but you'll always see this other thing come into ground. And that's their adding inductance. Because a short antenna before resonance, think of our monopole, lambda over four, it resonates. If it's shorter than lambda over four, it looks like a capacitor. So to make it radiate better, to get more power in, to match it, we need to add inductance to counter the capacitance. Well, a great way to add inductance is we just add a little stub of length here. So the magic of antenna design and RF design, all this stuff you're seeing over here is to match it. Let me quickly okay. show you a pattern. Yeah, only the, the uh, piece on the right is basically the antenna itself. That's the biggest radiator, that's correct. So this still radiates out here, but- So but where, this is is the, where is the- uh, three centimeter length. Uh, let's measure that actually. Let's go ahead and measure. See what we got here. Uh, our unit, first of all, what are our units here? Uh, well, we'll find out in a minute. Okay, let's go ahead and measure. There we go. So that whole length is 25.8. And I think uh, that's kind of useless unless we know dimensions. So let's see what that is. Millimeters, millimeters. 25.8 millimeters. Now, remember the monopole in air? Do we remember what that was? Was that, I believe it was 30.6. Yeah. So 25.8, why isn't it 30.6? Why? <laughs> it's a secret. You're on, you're on FR4. You're on FR4. Uh, so you're not so in So it's suddenly no speed of light. Yeah, or speed so of light. At, at speed of light is slower, and, uh. and so the dielectric makes the antenna smaller. So you can actually buy chip antennas. If you don't want to make an antenna, you know, you have, 
you can buy your trans receiver. You pretty much have to because it's pretty complicated to get real Bluetooth. And you buy that. Some of those have an antenna built into them, right? You can, it's just, you know, just this chip, if you will, and you, and you plunk it down. And the antenna is built in. Why not just do that? Well, you can. There's two problems. One is, uh, quite frankly, when you price them out, they're expensive. There's money. Okay. Uh, and the second reason is they're not as efficient antennas. So they're smaller. And you can, you can then also buy a chip that's just an antenna. You know, it's just on a chip and you mount the chip. Uh, they'll give you instructions how far to keep the ground plane underneath the way and all this. It's an antenna and it's in a dielectric. It's not inside that thing is dielectric. They can make a smaller antenna like we have here. It radiates at a smaller length. It's resonant at a smaller length because the dielectric affects the electromagnetic wave. There's a price to pay for it, uh, besides buying the chip, of course. They're less efficient. Because of the enemy domain? Uh, because, well, first of all, just the size, they're going to, you know, they rate, that's the uh, rate. Okay. And then second of all, you're heating the dielectric. I mean, that, that's just, what I mean here. <clears throat> yeah. And so you pay a price in performance, but they sure are easy to make. You just buy the thing and plunk it down. But uh, if the antenna is on this two layer PCB, it means one side is air. So is not the air helping? Uh, it is, it is helping. Yes, it is. So if we have this still, thing, It still slows down the signal. It's one way to think about it. I hate to use the word slow, but yeah, it affects, it affects the electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Uh, if you had it in, in the middle layer, you can imagine an eight layer board and you have this on layer three, and of course you don't have any ground above it. <clears throat> you don't have any ground above or below it, but it's, it, it, it then would even be smaller yet. And it would heat the FR4 more, um, and therefore uh, it would be less efficient. But you and especially you would have to calculate it by yourself and simulate it. <laughs> yeah, and by that time you're probably using numerical you know, software. Another okay. thing I want to mention since we're talking about this, Robert, is all of these dimensions are, well, obviously this dimension is critical, right? We've already said it's got to resonate. All this other stuff is critical because I said it's adding in, you know, inductance. And why did they flare this thing out? It wasn't just to make it look pretty. They're adding capacitance that's coupling over to here. So you see, here's an inductance to ground, and this is a capacitance hooked over to this inductor. So they get very fancy on all this stuff. The ground, the distance this guy is from the ground matters, okay? Because you're, 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 exciting, you're exciting currents in the ground plane, you're exciting currents right in here. See, this is attaching right here. The, the vias here matter, where they're positioned. It all matters. And that's called loading the antenna. All this stuff is loading the antenna. And I, let me show you a pattern on this one. Yeah, we'll uh, I, I would like to ask uh, um, one more question. So we also have to be careful. It means we have to use exactly same copper thickness. We have to use yes. exactly yes. same uh, dielectrical, mm -hmm. what they yeah. recommend what this PCB manufacturer or chip manufacturer recommends hey. for this antenna, we have to use it for our PCB. Yeah, it's all very important. So for example, if they say FR4 of 4.7, don't run out and get an FR4 of 3.2. It's so, gonna matter. And this basically matter. means that if someone is designing their own PCB, yeah. And even if they keep shape of this antenna, and if they don't follow all the other recommendations, they, the antenna may not be as efficient as it should be, or it may not even work. You might have a toaster. <laughs> you might just have all your, you might have an open circuit, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, or a okay. resistor. So let's have a look. Not, how... not... Well, let's look at some patterns. Yeah. Want to... Okay, here's the pattern. Now notice this thing, remember, okay, and just to remind, That is the PCB. <laughs> there, you, uh, <laughs> there it is right okay. there. Okay, you got it? Yeah, we lost the PCB. Okay, here's the pattern. Now notice this guy is a donut 
shape again. But remember the antenna is this, you know, we're in, we're. Um, so where the hall is, there is the ground. Well, the antenna now is this way, right? Mm -hmm. So see, if your receiver, remember we're out at infinity here. If your receiver is anywhere around here, you're in good shape. The place where you would be in trouble is if you were facing it this way, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't get any power coming this way. So the power doesn't go inside into the components on PCB. It just no. goes. Well, remember it's the heating PCB. the PCB, but again, remember Robert that the donut, this thing is at infinity. This all made it to infinity. How it looks from the other side. Yeah, sure. Looks like this. Notice it's not, it looks kind of like an apple, doesn't it? Okay. Ooh. Okay. See the, see the ground on the one side is blocking it. So now let's go back to your wristwatch. You got to think about that. Okay. So maybe if we put it this way, Maybe, you know, and your arm is over here, maybe mm -hmm. it'll radiate mm -hmm. So Now let me show you polarization. We talked about, this is interesting too. So notice this guy is radiating the gain in the maximum direction is about two. You see that number? 1.97 dBm, or dBi, excuse me. dBi means gain over I isotropic, over, over the perfect sphere, dBi. Okay, let's do this. This now, and let me make sure I'm telling you the right thing. See, it says E theta right here. Mm -hmm. This is the theta polarization. Oh, looks very different than the total. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at that. All so right. Now, <laughs> yeah, and remember this would be the E field is going up and down in this, you know, like here, right? We want, if we had a wire antenna, we want it oriented upward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let me show you the P direction. This is E phi. And you see this one, if we had a wire antenna receiver, I'd want it oriented this way. E theta, E phi. So we have, with the monopole, it was all E theta. Okay. All I, I lost I lost it. So what are these two <laughs> simulations okay. about? I, I, okay. I lost if, it. Yeah, if we go back to the monopole for a minute, remember the monopole? Yes. And I, I showed you, remember an electric field, a wave has a polarization to it. And we had that discussion about the direction you wanted yes. your antenna with the E field. And so, with our monopole, the E field is always this way. So we want our receiver this way. Yes. Okay. Now this inverted F antenna, this now, let's go back to the E theta again. Okay. This is that same vertical polarization. I'm only showing you the amount that radiates with the E field this way. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is uh, it, uh, one so part of the picture of what we seen yeah, before. It, yeah, because this antenna also radiates with the polarization this way. It does both. Mm -hmm. Okay, I and understand. And remember that. the total power I said was 2 dB? Mm -hmm. See here, 1.36. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is the theta. Now let me turn on the phi. That's the fee. Okay, I understand now. 1.68. It actually is, is radiating more with a phi polarization than a theta, but it still does a fair amount of theta. And Let's for look. these two different polarizations, we would need to have two different uh, uh, placement of the receiver antenna? To, to get absolutely best performance, but you're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. When your wristwatch is talking to your phone, you, it's just impossible to make sure, you know, you have, it'd be a disaster, right? You have to have your wrist, you know, exactly this mm -hmm. direction. It, it wouldn't be very good. So you basically want both polarizations for Bluetooth and you want a pattern that's fairly 
because I don't know where the thing is, you know, the transmitter or the receiver. So for Bluetooth pattern, I really kind of want both polars mm -hmm. on my antenna. And I don't want it very directional because I really don't know where the transmitter is. And so this is pretty good, right? If you think about it, here's your total power. Okay, we still have this guy coming in. Remember, you're always free to add a second antenna. Uh, a modern cell phone will have like six antennas in it. Mm -hmm. Inverted Fs still have antenna, you know, for different bands. And uh, plus, of course, they have Bluetooth, they have Wi-Fi, they have, of course, 4G, you know. So they, they can have six antennas in these things. You, you so could have another antenna in theory. Now, completely different question. We are yeah. still talking about uh, transmitting this signal. So how the antenna for the receiver, we need, do we need to have like different antenna for the receiver? It will be same antenna, no? Same antenna can also receive the signal. Yes, yes, that's correct, Robert. So an antenna by itself, and there's some, okay, so long, I'll give you the simple answer, yes. Okay. An, ante an antenna doesn't know if it's a transmitter or a receiver. Okay. And it behaves exactly the same for both. Okay. Now, just so I'm not accused of lying to you, Robert. So get really geeky, and this won't affect your viewers for this kind of antenna. There's something called reciprocity in electromagnetics. If everything is reciprocal, what does that mean? Basically, in terms of practicalities, if you don't have ferrets. What's a ferrite? Piece of iron. Uh, and a transformer, you know, metal. Uh, the end, which would be insane for an antenna. You wouldn't put it in metal. It wouldn't radiate. But it's got to be reciprocal. It always is for us. So yes, a transmitter and a receiver works. The patterns are the same. The imp input impedance is the same. It's all the same. Yeah. So now, how does it work? Uh, I thought you can do like full bandwidth transfer. Does it only work like half? It's transferring and then it's receiving. It cannot do both at the same time. Uh, no, it can do both at the same time. Sure. Hmm. Sure. Because so then it's I'm like, confused. And they both use the same antenna? Yes. Sure. How does it work? Well, uh, so, so what you would, so this depends on your electronics, your transceiver, not on the antenna. So we hook the transceiver up to the antenna. And hopefully it's well matched, right? So the transceiver sends a wave out, a signal out to the antenna, which in for circuits world, the input of the antenna we think of as a input impedance, it's matched, right? 50 ohms. Sends it out, it transmits. At the same time, now this depends on the electronics of the transceiver. At the same time, it's receiving. Okay. It's but where the receiver is the same pin. This, the receiver is the same pin, sure. Mm. So it can be, now it depends how they do it, but yeah, it can be. So to do that though, Robert, if it's receiving at the same time it's transmitting, somewhere in that electronics, it has to know the difference between a wave going out and a wave coming back. Ah, uh, okay. And there is circuitry that can do that, okay? If it can't do that, if it can't detect the difference between something going out and something coming back, right, then you have more troubles, you know. And, and I tell you the truth, this, see, this gets into the Bluetooth specification itself. Are they transmitting, pause, receive? What's the encoding scheme? This is all in that transceiver rich chip. Give you another example, another topic is radar. How does radar work? Well, radar has an antenna and the circuitry sends a pulse out and then it actually waits, same antenna, receives the pulse, sends it out, receives it. It's the same antenna, automotive radar, which they're developing. One chip, one antenna. Yeah, but the that circuitry. I understand. It's just interesting that you can do both at the same time. I didn't know that. And, and if, use the same if, antenna. If the circuit's smart enough to do it. 
but the circuitry has to be able to distinguish between the transmit and the receive. So this, and there's circuitry to do that, or they transmit, they wait. Okay, give me your reception. Okay, my and, turn. And how they, they, they do, they do it, it either. Uh, they need to use processor to recognize these two signals or it, uh, no, actually they do it at through that, some analog circuit? Uh, actually, at that point, what they typically would do, and I'm not an expert on this, so you know there might be other schemes. One way to do it would be the signal comes into the, okay, let's start with it, comes into the antenna, right? We have a signal and then they run it, they don't down convert it. Because of course, ultimately, the you know they want the data, which is down converted. They'll run it through, um, uh, and what they'll do is they'll run it through, for example, a uh, directional coupler, which is it does. It's an RF type of circuitry. You can build one on your board. It's a, it's a, it's a coupled section of lines, a quarter wavelength long with four ports, and they'll actually the directional coupler. They can start doing stuff like pick off the wave going one way versus the other. Oh, but you need, wow. Uh, they can use a circulator. So it's actually, it actually recognizes the signal which we are sending out one, and it, one it direction separates it from the signal yeah. which is coming in. That's one way to do it, yeah. yeah. And they actually wow. have, RF, they have RF components to do This it. is like completely new word for me. Well, it's a new world because to make those kinds of components and all you're, you got to talk about waves, transmission lines, you can make them on your board, a directional coupler, but there are all these things that rely on the concept of a wave to be able to make it. It might be another great talk for us. I could show you stuff like a directional coupler and a Wilkinson divider and an RF filter, which is not lumps. It's actually, you know, yeah, it's another whole world. And the reason you can do it on a board, you're high enough in frequency, these things get fairly small. If you try it at 10 megahertz, your board would have to be huge. Yeah. So you don't do it. You use a lumped R, a lumped L, a lumped C, like, like many of your viewers are used to. But in the world of RF, yeah, we have all kinds of wonderful things we can do. A uh, final example I want to show you is this guy. Uh, this came from a company, Cypress, who makes antennas and things. Uh, very nice website. And I wanted to point out, uh, if you go there, here's, here's the link. Uh, they have a very nice de design guide, free to viewers. And uh, it's about 100 pages long, and it gets into Smith charts and all this kind of stuff. So if, if people want an approachable play, I kind of skimmed through it. I didn't read the whole thing. But it looked like really kind of a nice introduction to a lot of these issues in different an antenna designs. And here's one I picked out of it. It's an inverted F, and you can see what they're doing. It's a little simpler F, but it still has the, the bent monopole with that extra tuning stub, right? Mm -hmm. And here they have this ground plane, and then they stitch ground vias to the ground below. And here's your line coming out, and this is 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. Now, I went ahead and simulated this guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm bringing this up, besides telling you this is a really nice design guide. To finish up, I just wanted to show you uh, what you get. Uh, and here we go. And there it is. I'm going to close all these windows. And there he is, Robert. And this is my simplified world of that antenna. Why do we need to use uh, so many VRs in the ground planes? Because we would like to have it like a really good ground plane. That's why. So yeah, many VRs. yeah. I mean, it's the same. I, I'm sure your viewers in their boards do this all the time. And with your signal integrity issues, which you know you have many videos on, in general, more grounds is better. So the yeah. distance between uh, vias itself is not so important. Uh, well, uh, that's if, good. Uh, I mean. Uh, it has to be less than something, but yeah. once it is less than something, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't how close matter. It, to, it doesn't matter too much. And so, for signal integrity, you have these rules of thumb, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people like Eric Bogatin have told you, I don't know what it is, lambda over ten, or you know, there's okay. these rules of thumb. Okay. 
Now, there is an interesting point about this antenna and the via placement, and I'll explain that in a minute, all right? Um, here's the antenna. Uh, it is, uh, the, the, you might wonder what this red cross is. It means when I snap the layout together, that thing stays put. So that's just for layout, okay, it's not real. What I did here is we can see I simplified it. In real life, okay, one minus one. So one, uh, if you want the uh, input to the antenna is of course here. Mm -hmm. And then the minus one, my ground reference is right here, which is the top ground plane. Mm -hmm. In real life, you of course would be continuing this line along down to the bottom and it would go off to your transceiver like in the picture, but I had to simplify it. So that's how I did mm -hmm. it. Here's the 3D picture. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I simplify, well, actually just, I, the vias look like circles when it simulates, they, simu they simplify to eight sides. Okay. When it meshes. Uh, why did I do that? It's fewer meshes and it shouldn't matter much, their ground vias. Okay, let's see how we did, right? So this is their antenna. I should show you, I guess, sh the patterns are so much fun to look at, right, Robert? You gotta show them the pattern. Is this the right one? That's E phi, is this E total? This is E total. Kind of similar. It's a donut, like mm -hmm. we got before. So this Kinda is the total, sense. okay? This is, these the are both directions. And then as long as we talked about this, let's go E theta and E phi. So here's the E theta. This two polarizations going on here, right? There's the, mm -hmm. pretty similar to before. And here's the E phi. Mm -hmm. And kind of that whole discussion. So this kind of makes sense, right? Now, here's what I want to show you, though. Let's look at the input impedance of this antenna. Okay, here it is. Now, this again is S11, S parameters, mm -hmm. negative numbers in dB. When people say return loss, it's just the negative of this number. Return loss is, is the reflection coefficient, but they, they don't make it negative, right? So this number in dB minus, what am I at here? To 5.5 dB minus, and uh, so for example, 3 dB, 50% of the power is being reflected. You're not mm -hmm. even getting it into the antenna. And what's the math here? We have to do the math. So 6 dB, yeah, I'd have to do the math. You know off the top of your head, Robert, minus 6 dB? No, no but I, I'm thinking about the uh, graph before went mm -hmm. uh, much lower. It was like minus 16. That's what I wanted to bring up. So that's, that I believe this I, antenna I, is not as good as the previous one? It's a lousy antenna. Mm -hmm. This is, we're not happy with, I'm losing, my transceiver, all the power is coming back at me. I'm losing a lot, it's, it's, it's not good. And I don't want to use the word efficiency. Mm -hmm. That's how much actually radiates once it's in the antenna. Mm -hmm. But in this example here, I'm uh, not even getting, and let me, I think I've got, So basically, it's very nice that we see all the uh, fields, but the fields for the second antenna, they are not, uh, the antenna is not going to be so efficient, so it's not going yeah, to so reach so far away, for example, or? Well, okay, so what's going on? And I have an efficiency, I thought I had an efficiency. I did an efficiency number on the other inverted F. I, I don't have it here, I didn't calculate it. Uh, for the other one, I believe the efficiency was about 90%. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, is that good? Well, remember, that's power getting into the antenna. Mm -hmm. So let's assume it's similar here, 90% efficiency. I don't have the number because it's FR4 and stuff. So what does this say? Okay. So first of all, minus 6 dB, we put 1 milliwatt from the transceiver toward the antenna. 20% of it never makes it into the antenna. That's mm -hmm. a that's not good. I want to see this 10 dB or lower. 
The other antenna was beautiful. It was 20 dB. My return loss was 20 dB. Only 1% didn't make it into the antenna. Then the efficiency says of the power that gets into the antenna, 90% of it will actually radiate. Uh, when, we are, when we are talking about this, it means, uh, it means that the um, range of the antenna is going to be smaller for the same, uh, same power, correct? Out of the transceiver, yeah. Yes. That's yeah, what I mean. So obviously when I buy the tra when I buy my transceiver chip, it puts out a certain amount of power. Maybe they can vary it a little bit, but right, there's a certain amount of maximum power. So yeah, you're wasting power. If you have a badly matched antenna, it's not even getting to the antenna. So instead so of I need to, I need meters, to... you will only receive signal five meters from the Basically. Yeah, yeah, because half your power, you know, like in my case, 20% of my power uh, didn't even uh, make it to the antenna, right? So, <clears throat> what do you do? Okay, well, first of all, do you scrap this whole design? Probably not. I mean, we got this from that antenna guide, right? I mean, they got, they got it to work better. I'd love to see better than 20 dB. I sure want to see at least 10. So there's a couple of things we, so we need to fix it. Mm -hmm. So the first, so somehow this is not a very good match. And this now would be where I'd really have to start studying things. Okay. One way to do this would be um, you basically have to start playing with it. Mm -hmm. And I go back to the picture in the guide and I just eyeballed it, you know, I just kind of quickly drew it. For example, they didn't have this notch here. They came straight down. Mm -hmm. That matters. You mentioned the via separation doesn't matter that much. They had specified 15 mil vias, 40 mil separation. Okay. They exactly tell you. Exactly. Now, I can't believe it matters where my cursor is back here, but it may matter right here, right? Mm -hmm. It may be critical. Um, they weren't actually, I think, I don't even think they gave me a DXF layout, put into layout. They didn't really give me all of the dimensions, mm -hmm. okay? So for example, I think this line width might be a little bit narrower. Mm -hmm. What I wanna conclude with is, for an antenna, getting the pattern is pretty easy. It's, it's a really gross feature, okay? Uh, and, what, and what I mean by that is, you know, like uh, we have this dumbbell shape for our pattern. If you ask me to change that shape, with, it, it's hard to do. It, it's kind of like no matter how much I futz with all this stuff, it's going to be the same shape. I can if I put it next to the watch, the watch next to the wrist, I change the shape. Mm -hmm. The ultimate disaster for changing the shape, and they actually say this in the manual, I don't know why, I thought it was kind of funny. It said, uh, environment matters for your antenna. Like, if you put it in a metal box, it won't radiate, right? Which I thought was kind of funny. Like, but it's true. If, it's you, true, if yeah. you have this antenna pattern, and then it's sitting next to your metal wristwatch, right? It's gonna affect the pattern. And then ultimately, if you put it in a metal box, it can't get through it, it won't radiate. Okay, but other than that, it's kind of a gross, gross sort of thing. So how, how would you improve this? Or you would like completely change the shape of this antenna? And when No, I probably something? wouldn't. Okay, so, well, the pattern, to improve the pattern, the dumbbell, to get it more directive, a higher gain, I probably have to use a completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's very difficult with. I only have lambda over four to work with. Uh, you could go to a full dipole lambda over two, which is the string vibrating fixed on both ends, right? And you can buy a dipole antenna. They feed it in the middle. Imagine, if you will, this guy coming out this direction. Mm -hmm. That gets you a little more directed by a dB. It's changing the pattern. But for these kinds of antennas, there's not a lot you can do, quite frankly, on that. 
you get me so, into phase phase arrays and stuff, I can do things with the pattern. But but with this type of antenna, it's pretty much what I get. You don't want a highly directed pattern. I remind you again, you don't know where the receiver is. You probably like a sphere, right? The final point I want to make though, getting that guy to be exactly 50 ohms so you get really good, you know, power. Efficiency and yeah. That's hard to do. And okay. the reason is it depends critically. It's not like the pattern, which is kind of this lambda over four gross shape. It's all these details. Mm -hmm. How far separated are the vias? How wide is this line? If I bring this line over here, uh, I'm reducing the capacitive coupling to this guy, mm -hmm. but I'm increasing the inductance a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, if I take this ground cut away and I bring it here, I'm making a little more inductance. So this is where you just have to play with it and play with it and play with it. And this is partly why when you get those designs that have been made for you, they're so nice, right? But you have to follow them really carefully. Mm -hmm. and I didn't. I just kind of eyeballed it. And, I said, mm -hmm. That's not right. and you saw what I got. It wasn't all that good. Mm -hmm. And so I had, and so, so this is why when Texas Instruments or um, Cypress, they give you these designs, be very careful to follow them very carefully. When they say FR4 4.7, they mean it. When they say the vias are spaced this way, it's not for back here, but it's right at the input of the antenna. They might mean it. The width of the line, yes, it really matters. It, it, it's all highly critical. This or is very interesting very... that just making it a little bit wider or thinner, it's going to influence change, the design you know. so much. It can, yes. It's not the pattern. You'll still get the pattern, but you're not going to get any power into the mm -hmm. antenna in a terrible case. So, so quite frankly, antenna designers, a lot of what they worry about is the input impedance into the antenna, mm -hmm. getting that matched up. What if, you know, the best you can do, you only get it to be 75 ohms. I mean, you've tried and you've tried and tried and, and the transceiver wants it 50 ohms. Well, now at that point on your board, you can start doing filtering, mm -hmm. you know, and other tricks to match 75 to 50. And there are ways to do that. You can do that, and that can be good. Uh, uh, typically, for these types of antennas, when you go around and see various designs, they might put a little chip L and a chip C, you know, a couple of little discrete components right near the feed mm -hmm. to match it. And they go, look, I just got 75 ohms plus J10. But I've then, got a match. You know what I would say? If, mm. if uh, it's so important on the shape of this copper, then if you buy a capacitor, it's going to have some tolerance and then I would not believe you would always get same results for every PCV you produce. Uh, if you want to make a hundred of these and you want them all to work and you, you know, you're worried about manufacturing throughput, it has to be. Uh, you are absolutely. You are absolutely correct. If you had a ten percent capacitor, a cheap capacitor, you may have to buy a one percent. You may have to work. And this is where RF design starts coming in. You know, so it's like they start worrying about, you know, reproducibility. Uh, remember too, the price you pay for adding all these things like L's and C's and stuff, you are reducing bandwidth. I have hey, I have one more question. Yeah, Can I one ask? more question? Yeah, sure. Okay, so if you would like to tweak uh, impedance of this antenna, you would use the special graph what you showed me before. Smith, Smith chart. Yeah, so that that's. Uh, I would. I would. That. That's exactly does, where you would be looking. To well, improve. the beautiful thing that can we see it for this antenna? How how uh, different? Yeah, it we is? can. Sure, why not? I, uh, do I have one? Oh, I have one. Aren't you lucky? There it oh, is. Oh, okay. Now, what this is, and, and I... So why, why this is worse from this graph? How we can see this is yeah, worse well, than the from previous, the previous one? 
The previous one, I don't know if you remember it that well, but it, it was a purple curve and it kind of came Yes. You want the ideal antenna, 50 ohm antenna. This is normalized to 50 ohms, 50 ohm Smith chart. You can, they have other ones. You can do 75 ohms, whatever you want. 50 ohm Smith chart, we want to be right in the middle. So that would be only small dot. That would be the small ideal. Small dot. If I had a small dot, I'd be so happy. Right <laughs> okay. in the middle. That means all the power is going in the antenna. Nothing's coming back. Um, but it's not. And this one is further away from the middle of the... Uh, and it's also longer. And it's also up here. This means it's more reactive. Along this axis, it's a real impedance, inductive, capacitive. So if you look at 2.45 gigahertz, can we find it? Yeah, 2.5 gigahertz right here. It's um, the resistance, and I don't know if you can read that, it's pretty small, but it says 0 0.31. Multiply that by 50, 50 ohm Smith chart, uh, that's about 15 ohms. You're looking into 15 ohms and you want 50. Mm -hmm. The transceiver says, I need 50 ohms. So that's what I want. So you got to match it. You got to mm -hmm. come up with a way to match it. Either you have to improve the feed of the antenna to get it closer to 50, which is the first thing I try. And hopefully with their design follow more accurately, I don't know, maybe we can get into here or something. And then the other thing I can do is say, okay, I got to match 15 ohms to 50 to get my maximum power transfer. It's the best I can do. Up here, we not only have, again, it's 15 ohms, but there's an imaginary part, a reactive part of about 0.5. We have 25 ohms of reactance, of inductance, from inductance. And so I probably want to be adding capacitance, and the Smith chart can tell you how much, and the combo of those two, then we want to get to the middle of the Smith chart, right? Okay. So that, that's, that's what, and the Smith chart is a wonderful chart because in one picture, it can tell me all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, as you get more advanced usage with it, you can even say, if I have one L and one C, you know, think of a series L and a parallel C for my matching network, it can tell you what those values should be and you start following the L's this way and the C's this way. So with the Smith chart, an RF engineer can just see a whole lot. Otherwise, you've got your input impedance, the real part, the imaginary part. They're separate graphs. It tells you no, uh, you can't see visually how you should match it. So it's kind of fun that for our world of computers and our world of graphics and we have all that stuff, this chart from 1920 by Mr. Smith is still the quickest and most intuitive way to view all this stuff, if you're an RF engineer. Now, if you don't know a Smith chart, you're probably like, uh, this looks incredibly complicated. Once you get used to it, it uh, it's just the immediate thing you look at. So you when, look when at we, this graph and you know, okay, I need to add this kind of, I need to add some inductance, I need to remove some capacitance. and This, this will visually tell you what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's everything for today's video. I would like to thank you so much to John. And I would like to thank you so much to John. And I would like to thank you so much to Cadence, because without them, we would not have this video. I learned a lot. I. I really hope you found it uh, interesting. Leave comments, okay? If uh, you would like to create some new videos on this topic, leave comments because I can have another call with John. Uh, also, let me know what do you think about this video, if you found it useful. Leave comments also uh, to John if you have questions or just if you would like to say that if you if you like or if you found this video useful don't forget if you like this video then press the like button if you would like to see more videos like this then uh, please subscribe because that's what is helping me a lot to contact new people uh, i would like to thank you very much for watching and uh, see you next time
Bye.